now for the discussion for the Mizor University. I welcome you on this auspicious occasion. Uh, today we are very fortunate that our Honorable Speaker of Mizoram, Sri Hikai, have accepted our invitation as a guest speaker. And also, we are really appreciate that you present an important and interesting topic, parliamentary democracy and its practices in India. And I do hope that this program will be success only through your active and sincere participation and only through your cooperation. Uh, though we all have the program, uh, may I read out the order of the program for today even? I'm the chairman, Jarila Kumasana, treasurer of discussion forum, and welcome speech and report will be done by uh, Screen Material and CME Joint Secretary Discussion Forum. And our guest speaker, uh, Screen Hippe, Honorable Speaker, Mizoram Legislative Assembly, will address the gathering on the topic Parliamentary Democracy and its Practices in India. And there will be an interaction, an interaction session in which I kindly request the participant to kindly raise the question and ask him uh, the uh, uh, speaker paper as well as his uh, as well as his political career and his view and opinion regarding Mizoram uh, politics and all. And uh, Mr. Nadi Diana, our general secretary, will propose a vote of thanks. And we would like to have a light refreshment in the interaction session. Uh, now, in order to begin our program, may I call upon uh, our respected Joint Secretary, Discussion Forum, Screen Material and CME, to have a report and welcome speech. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for attending this uh, program with such a short notice. Um, the discussion forum uh, from Missouri University has uh, organized a lot of uh, interactive sessions uh, based on uh, a lot of topics that has been uh, different from a lot of topics, uh, I mean a lot of fields of studies. First of all, I'd like to report on the, the, uh, the discussion forum's um, programs that we have had in, in, the, in, the, in the days that have gone by. Um, First of all, we had uh, the interactive session with the Mizoram Sindhu Campus Ministry, which was um, illuminating the minds, um, the Christianity and worldviews. We had a, a long discussion, uh, discussion based on that. And second of all, we have had uh, an awareness campaign and uh, an, uh, yeah, a scientific study of Alzheimer's disease, which was um, we had a resource person from the health ministries, um, I mean the health department of the Mizoram directory, and. We have had organized quiz and debate competitions during the Vibro sessions, uh, Vibro dates of uh, Missouri University, and has been successful so far. And today we are very honored and um, humbled as well to have our honorable speaker to, uh, to be with us and accepting our uh, her, our humble request to uh, to be with us today and have an interaction session with us. And um, I'm not going to be speaking a lot. Of, uh, the, this time, uh, I'm just here to introduce our honorable guest today. Um, could you, sir, could you please rise for me a seat? Let's give him a big hand. Um, our resource person for today is uh, Sri Dipi from the, the Mizoram University of Mizoram. Legislative Assembly, he is a, he's a speaker, he's a current speaker of the Legislative Assembly right now. And um, this session started with the interactive session that was held with the four semester students of political science. In their interaction, they has they have mentioned uh, about about uh, their um, their need and their desire to have an interactive session, interactive session with the speaker of the uh, of the assembly. And right today, we have seen the fruit of. Uh, work of the discussion, the Missouri University discussion forum and um, yeah it's humbling and an honor to have you sir in our midst today. With the enthusiasm and the motivational act of accepting our humble approach, the Missouri University discussion forum took up the cause of this interactive session that we're having right now. So uh, the topic of today's discussion will be parliamentary democracy and its practices in India. Most of us uh, not all of us are aware of the, the, the system of parliamentary democracy as well, I mean, despite the fact that most of us are 
not uh, students of the social sciences, some of us are from economics departments, from, uh, according to what I've observed. Yeah, and so today would be, uh, I hope today would be an, uh, a fruitful session from our honorable speaker. And uh, for that, on behalf of Mizoram University, I'd like to thank and welcome Sri Pei, the honorable speaker of Mizoram Legislative Assembly. Thank you, sir. In order to have more time with our main topic, uh, parliamentary democracy and its practice in India, we are not moving out of the uh, war program. We will mainly focus on the main event for today's topic. And may I request upon our respected speaker, uh, Sri Hipe, to deliver his speech on parliamentary democracy and its practice in India. Sir, please. Parliaments, 
while others are single chambered. These legislative bodies are culturally elected that by the people with a roughly equal number of citizens electing a delegate to represent their opinions and interests in Parliament. India had the great benefit of starting its journey under the leadership of Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru during the defining years of each freedom and a great, line, a great lineup of visionary and sagacious men and women provided effective leadership in the task of consolidating democracy and inlaying the institutional foundations of the Republic. Nehru was a democrat by instinct and temperament and contributed immensely to work inculcating the true parliamentary spirit and values in our people. Although he commanded absolute majority in the House, he never believed in steamrolling the opposition and showed utmost respect to them, listened to their views and tried to accommodate them as far as possible. He recognized the new space of dissent in a true democracy, favoring healthy and constructive criticism from all sections of the House. Even some of his strongest critics in Parliament happened to be his greatest admirers, and perhaps there cannot be a better compliment to Nehru's democratic credentials than this fact. One of the most important aspects of Indian constitution is its federal and unitary nature. Constitutions are divided between federal and unitary. In a unitary constitution, all powers are vested in the central government to which the authorities in the unit are subordinate and function as the agents of the government of the central and exercise authority by delegation from the center. In case of a federal polity, under normal circumstances, the constitution is rigid. Written and powers are divided between the federal government and that of the provincial government. In case of Indian constitution, it has been variously described as quasi federal, federal with a strong unitary, federal in structure but unitary in spirit, federal in normal times but with possibilities of being converted into a purely unitary one during particularly in emergency. It is extremely difficult then to put our constitution in any strict mode of federal or unitary type. It cannot be considered as purely unitary because it provides for distribution of executive and legislative powers between the union and the states and provisions affecting the powers of the state or Indian state, then center cannot amend without ratification by the state, that is the constitutional amendment. It cannot be considered strictly federal because the recidivary raw powers vest in the Indian, as Dr. Ambedkar rightly pointed out, rigidity and legalism were the two various serious weaknesses of the federalism. The Indian constitution is in it, in that it created a dual policy with a single Indian citizenship, which could be both unitary and federal according to requirements of time and circumstances. The leadership of India during 1940s had a clear view what form of government could suit India at the time. 
Nehru, as well as other Congress leadership, wanted to have a strong central government which could have a substantial hold on the states. This was necessary because India was at a very fragile state. Due to the demand of Pakistan, the demand from other parts of India to create different countries on the basis of language, ethnicity, etc., the leaders were very apprehensive in creating a strong federation as it may lead to disintegration of India into many countries. It should be remembered that India is not a nation state, but a state nation. We have strong allegiance towards our native land, language, ethnicity, community, culture, and religion. In a common man's conscience, the nation comes at the end. This is the reason which leads to the creation of Andhra Pradesh and later Telangana. There has been demand for separation from northeast states like Nagaland Point because the cultural differences between this part of India and the mainland is very huge. A local or a remote village in Nagaland may not associate himself with India and Bharat Mata. Our leaders were very much aware of this fact and wanted to have a strong central government to prevent the disintegration of the country. India received independence from SLO on the 15th of August 1947. On 29th of August 1947, the Constituent Assembly set up a drafting committee under the chairmanship of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar to prepare a draft constitution for India. The constitution of <coughs> India was adopted, as you know, on the 26th November and 1949 and came into force on 26, 1950. Attaining independence from the British rule was not just a movement to achieve freedom. It was the to free ourselves from various social evils and social economic inequities and discrimination. The overall transformation of the country. It was with this larger national objective that a democratic quality based on parliamentary system was established. Attaining independence from British, British rule was not, sorry, oh, the, uh, sorry. At the time of independence, Westminster form of government was undoubtedly better, suited Indian needs. Keeping in mind the differences in our country from the two models, that is, United States and United Kingdom, like pluralistic society, fragile union of states, etc., let's look into some factors that went into deciding in our each favor and are still relevant. Presidential form of government can sometimes lead to a deadlock between the executive and legislative, like the one essentially in the United States, where the Congress did not allow the budget to pass, leading to a shutdown. The need of the hour was fast-paced development that India could not really afford frequent deadlock even that it had a multitude of representation in the parliament. Parliamentary government allows more space to accommodate political heavyweights from different regions and communities. This placates the regional leaders and helps in developing a sense of equal participation. This was needed even more in the 1950s. 50s 
One so many states were suspicious of joining India and others were ready to secede. In a new democracy, accountability is proud, needed more than stability of government. Now that India is such a vibrant democracy, the need for the one minister, world minister system is still relevant. Legislative can more effectively control the government two ministerial responsibilities, which is secured on a continued basis, unlike the presidential form, where there is lesser control and one has to wait for the next election. In a pluralistic society, such government is more representative and promotes participatory decision making. Authoritarian tendencies are better checked. The process of democracy in Indian Parliament begins with the process of electing the representatives as envisaging part 15 of the Constitution, with the citizens of India elected our representatives, member of parliament, to represent each and every region and community within our country. This clearly denotes the democratic nature of being a part of country's government. Due to this election, we have the following prime ministers since our independence, duration and party affiliation ID to you. Dora Nehru, Kuldaral Lalanda, Lal Bahadur Sachi, Kuldaral Nanda, Indira Gandhi, Moradi Desai, Charan Singh, Indira Gandhi, Rajiv Gandhi, VP Singh, Chanda Sekhar, Bibi Narasimha Rao, Atal Bihari Vajpayi, H.D. Dev Gauda, I.K. Kujaral, L.D. Vajpayi, Maan Mohan Singh, and Narendra Modi, today's Prime Minister. I joined the Parliament in the time of Mr. V.P. Singh in 1990s. As a democracy, democracy system of government by the whole population or the eligible members of a state, typically through elected representatives. By choosing a representative for parliament and state assembly through election, the participation of a common man in the government truly denotes the parliamentary democracy. <coughs> The process of democratic parliamentary can also be seen from the parliament consisting of two houses called the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha. The Lok Sabha in Hindi is known as House of the People or the Lower House. Almost all of each members are directly elected by the third citizens of India. Rajya Sabha. The Rajya Sabha, as you know, is also known as Council of States, or the Upper House. Each member are indirectly elected by members of the legislative bodies of the state. The Lok Sabha being the House of Directly Elected Representatives, we have to look at. The Lok Sabha being the House of Directly Elected Representatives, generally the Prime Ministers and Council of Ministers were chosen from it, from the Lok Sabha before. But, however, from the midterm of Indira Gandhi's tenure, members from Rajya Sabha were also appointed as member of Council of Ministers and even the Prime Minister. Bills were passed after having debated in both the Houses on the pros and cons and become silent. The recent emergence of a proactive civil society and its movement against corruption, which has brought in the people's power 
to the forefront as founder standard and written our democracy. For example, the passing of the law power bills and the RPI law established by the parliament is an important landmark in the evolution of our system of governance into a tra transparent and accountable one and that of democratic nature. The enactment, enactment of the Right of Information Act should be seen not as the end of the movement for access to information, but rather the beginning of parliament, uh, parliament democratic natures. One of the main effects, in my opinion, of having two chambers in the parliament is that the upper home did not have that much authority in governing the country. For all the important bills, like money bill, were only executed by the lower house, that is the Lok Sabha. Further, even a party acquires full majority in the lower house, it does not mean that they automatically have majority in the upper house. For instance, in, at the present situation, the National Democratic Alliance has absolute majority in the lower house, that is Lok Sabha. But in the upper house, <coughs> the UPA holds majority. This leads to the inability of passing a bill as desired by the ruling party. Because of the competitive and confrontational politics, parliament cannot fun sometimes appropriately discharge its essential function, debates and discussions, the whole marks of democracy have been overshadowed by disruptions, confrontations, and other non-democratic alternatives. It is a matter of money for the presiding officers that several legislations of far-reaching importance are passed by parliament without any serious discussion. There is a growing feeling of resentment and concern when the budget of a billion plus people is passed without any discussion due to disruption of proceedings. With frequent disruptions and forced adjournments of parliament by the opposition, Becoming the order of the day, the public sector is likely to lose scores of rupees. According to official estimates, running the house cost 29,000 per minute. This would mean approximate loss of 1.5 crores on a day when no business is transacted at the number of days and hours was that the loss figures at the end of each session is huge. It is the constitutional duties of the elected members for parliament and state legislature to function smoothly by the rules of procedure devised to facilitate its orderly functioning. Unfortunately, after decades of independence, we have come to a state when questions are being asked about the utility and relevance of parliament in our polity and indeed about the compatibility of our democratic setup based on the parliamentary system. <coughs> the emergence of coalition politics in our country hindered the proper functioning of democracy. Difference in interest and ideology of the party within the government even deteriorate our country economy and lead to instability in the government. History has a time and again shown that unlimited power in the hands of one person or two in most cases means that others are suppressed or their powers curtailed. 
The suppression of power in a democracy is to prevent abuse of power and to safeguard freedom for all. The system of suppression of power divides. The tax of the state into three branches, that is legislative, executive, and judicial. These three branches check one another. These tasks are assigned to different institutions in such a way that each of them can check the others. As a result, no one institution can become so powerful in a democracy as to destroy the system. Thus, the separation of powers is an essential element of the rule of law and is enshrined in the Constitution. The three powers can be categorized like this. The legislative power. The first of the three powers has to ta the task of passing of law and supervising their implementation. Legislative assembly or legislature to pass the law and implement. It is exercised by parliament or state legislature. Parliament checks the words of the executive. The government has to justify itself in Parliament in the respect of everything it does or causes the administration to do. The executive power. The executive branch is the task of implementing law. It comprises the federal government, the federal president, and all federal authorities, including the police and armed forces. The judicial power, such as administer justice, they decide disputes independently and impartially. It is their task to ensure that laws are complied with judges cannot be deposed and cannot be assigned other positions against their will. The only influence the legislator has on the judiciary is that it passes the law that the court said to comply with. Function acts as a great instrument of instructing effective operation. Oh. Now, come, let's go to the role of opposition in the house. Having an opposition in the house emphasizes the role of vigilance in keeping the government on leash. It gets government initiated laws and policies under scrutiny and offer coordinated policies. Often shadow cabinet members themselves become ministers when the opposition gets to form the government. Opposition unity and integrity is an important role in maintaining democracy inside and outside the house as unity and integrity of the ruling dispensation. For maintaining proper parliamentary democracy, I opine that too strong opposition in some way hampers the functioning of the parliament as well as state assembly. I used to regard the role of opposition in parliament and state assembly as red TV, wherein amount added to dishes to be in an exact manner, adding of too much would be unappetizing and unplanted. This is due to the fact that enough required amount, if added, in a disease makes the taste more delightful. But when too much is added, it spoils the whole dishes and the whole meal become unplanted. Likewise, too strong opposition somehow acts as an obstacle for smooth functioning of the parliament and state assembly. On the other hand, opposition with constructive manner and thought proves a great blessing for running of smooth government. Therefore, opposition with exact number, with lot of ruling, enhance efficient and effective parliamentary function and act as a great instrument for 
constructing effective democracy. Without constructive minds within the opposition, the true spirit of democracy hampers the spirit of democratic values. There is a decline in the efficiency and dedication of the parliament as an institution of accountability. The purpose served by the parliamentary democracy, this issue has become a matter of great debate. Some of the prominent politicians of today advocate the application of presidential form of government in India due to the above inability of the smooth functioning of the parliament. However, in my opinion, presidential systems do have many merits, but for our nation, I did not advocate the presidential system due to the fact that by learning from the election procedure and the ways of obtaining vote by many politicians, it will be inevitable to choose Kenster of Buddha for our presidents directly by the people, where many wealthy criminal politicians could force and buy vote from the people, indebted with poverty. Father, our nation would not have ability to cope with it, as our literacy rate is still very low, and that the larger population of the country have no ability to decide who is most fitted for it. Going by the statistics, this never election of 2014, that is parliament, has seen the highest number of politicians with criminal record being elected to the Indian parliament. As a par, as par record, every third newly elected MP in the Indian parliament has a criminal record. An analysis of 541 or 543 winning candidates by Association for Democratic Reform. So that 186, about that is about 34% of the newly elected MPs have confessed in their election affidavit that they have criminal cases. The report reveals that nine Indian leaders in the parliament have murder cases well, other 17 have attained to murder cases against them. Similarly, there are two MPs who have cases related to crime against women. The report notes that among the elected leaders in the parliament, there are 16 with cases related to communal disharmony registered against them. There are 10, 10 MPs who, be, who have been charged with robbery cases in the Koiti, and seven have cases related to kidnapping, 63 elected MPs from the ruling party, Bharatiya Dhanata Party, had serious criminal charges against them. The report notes that three out of 44 winners from Indian National Congress Three out of 37 winners from AIAD DMK, eight out of 18 winners from Sikh Sena, and four out of 34 winners fired by All India Chinamul Congress have declared serious criminal cases against themselves in their affidavit. Interestingly, the report also notes that the chance of winning was higher for candidates with criminal cases compared to the candidate with a clean record. Very amazing. During my tenure as a member of parliament, Raja Sipa, for two consecutive terms, I have seen and witnessed many anti-democratic activities within and outside the parliament. This is due to the fact that Many members were elected for their representatives by the people without the ability of using their conscience. But, but 
by means of oppression to cheating down their rights and dignity. This <coughs> happens. And I'm sorry, this hampers the true spirit of democracy. Some of the members of parliament did not even know the principle of constitution and democracy. They were simply elected with the involvement of their wealth and might, and not by the way of free and fair election. Due to this disruption of the whole, frequently occurred. Whatever problems our parliamentary democracy is facing today could, of course, be improved. May it be the instability syndrome, criminalization of politics, or even parliament being forcibly made dysfunctional through disruption, confrontation, or forced adjournment. As has been rightly said by Dr. Rajendra Prasad, if the people who are elected are capable and men of character and integrity, they would be able to make the best even of an effective constitution. If they are lacking in this, a constitution cannot have the country. After all, a constitution like a machine is a lifeless thing. It acquires life because of men to control it and operate it. And India needs today nothing more than a set of honest politicians who will solemnly resolve in constituting India into a sovereign socialist, secular democratic republic, also securing and promoting justice, social, economic, and political aspect of the country. Thank you very much. Can you 
a special inviting and a boy now. The Dino Serajo, Manaswama, a new university for a certain so I know I put a year business of Macal Vega, the no containing business men in South Vega, and he was a good one, and he got the two seven in Rosal to join. Baik sahaja makanan, baik sahaja makanan, tu cuma kita ambil baik kita pemain sorbet dia. Kan tu tu. Ya, terima kasih. 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 Ter the Honorable Speaker of Mizoram Legislative Assembly, Sri Muntara, the present chairman of discussion forum Mizoram University, also my batchmate during our school days, and Mr. Lerman Tuyarenthe, Vice Chairman, Mr. Lerman General Secretary, my most truthful friend who used to sit next to me during my college days, Mrs. Lerman Siami, the Joint Secretary of Discussion Forum and Mr. Lerman Gimach, the Vice President, if I'm not mistaken, the Vice President of Student Council with our own University, who used, to my, who used to be my friend during the higher studies also, who used to sit near me, and all the other representatives of the Student Council with our own University and as well as the faculties and officials of the Mizoram University and my dear students of Mizoram University. I thank you all for giving me this opportunity to attend this seminar related to the topic Parliamentary Democracy and its Practices in India. Focusing to our topic, <coughs> the Constitution of India provides for a parliamentary form of government both at the center and the state, Article 74 and 75 of the Indian Constitution deals with the parliamentary democracy at the center and Article 163 and 164 in the states. Modern democratic states are now classified into the parliamentary and presidential on the basis of nature of relations between the executive and the legislative organs of the government. The parliamentary system of democracy is one in which the executive is responsible to the legislature for its policies and acts. However, parliamentary democracy can also be stated as the responsible democracy abide by the people. The parliamentary democracy, however, has several features. As I studied by myself, just like those features where the nominal and the real executives majority of the party rule, collective responsibility, prevents despotism, ready the alternate government, and white representation. But as everything has two aspects, namely the bright side and the dark side, the parliamentary democracy and its practices in India, from my point of view, also have several demerits. The parliamentary system of democracy regularized in India suffers from the following demerits that are the unstable government. The parliament system does not provide a stable government. There is no guarantee that a government can survive its tenure. And no confidence motion or political defection or evils of multi-party coalition can make the government unstable. The government headed by Sri Morati Desai, Charan Singh, VP Singh, Chandra Sekhar, Devagoda, and I can go well are some of that examples. Continu continuity of policies, dictatorship of the cabinet, and against the se separation of powers and government by amateurs can also be the deterioration of the despite of the parliamentary democracy at the Indian context as a whole. However, the main reasons for adopting the parliamentary system or the type of democracy in India, familiarity with the system, the framers of the Indian Constitution are seemed likely to be familiar with the parliamentary system as it had been in operation in New India during the British rule. Preference to responsibility, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar pointed out in the Constituent Assembly that 
that democratic executive must satisfy the condition that is the stability and responsibility. Unfortunately, it has not been possible so far to devise a system which can ensure both in equal degree. For the need to avoid legislative and the executive conflicts also, the nature of the also it might be can cause due to the nature of the Indian society. As we all know that India is one of the most complex plural societies in the world. Hence, the framers of the constitution adopted the plural societies in the world. Mm, adopted the parliamentary system of democracy as it offers greater scope for giving a representation to the various section, interests and regions in the government. They expected to promote a spirit among the people and tends to build a united India. Now, I like to speak in Mizopoin Pasoyve, University Discussion Forum in Student Council in the ตอนนี้ก็สวยงามตัดเตี้ยอมารอชูจิตสร้างตัดเตี้ยที่ทำมีเพรสเซนเตชันการส่งสิบบาทอาคารการสปีกอาสมการส่งสิบสองหัวส
uh, self opinion that is there yes in words there is really a, a separation of judiciary yes but uh, on the ground reality if uh, the chief minister of Mizoram, for example may just make a single call one that night uh, to the whoever the judiciary charges will that change uh, the whole face uh, of that issue that burning issue that's my first question and um, about uh, uh, my second question is uh, about the role of opposition in the house. Here, our respected uh, speaker said that I opine that too strong opposition in some way hampers the functioning of parliament as well as state assembly. And uh, down here, it's, uh, it's also highlighted likewise too strong opposition somehow act as an obstacle for smooth functioning of the parliament and state assembly. Uh, my doubt is that there's a saying when the, when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. See, from, uh, from my position, uh, from my opinion, uh, if uh, there is a strong opposition as well as there will be a strong ruling, ruling party. So I uh, respectively oppose our respected speaker on this issue and uh, I like uh, I want I would like him to further uh, elaborate on this uh, topic the third question is that uh, it is said in the next page that uh, by um, however in his opinion our respected of uh, speaker opinion presidential system do have merits but for our, name, uh, but for our nation I did not advocate the presidential uh, system due to uh, the fact that by learning from the election procedure and the ways of uh, obtaining vote by many politicians, this will be inevitably to choose Gangster or Gunda for our president directly by the people. Let's stop there. Yeah, I am a student of political science, mainly concerned with the government and politics of India and Mizoram and the uh, whole world of sort. And um, I think uh, my question is that, uh, my question is that uh, looking to some uh, issues in electoral politics, is this the same issue in parliamentary democracy also? Because uh, in parliamentary democracy, there has to be a candidate. Here it is mentioned that, uh, where, uh, I can't, um, with wealthy criminal politicians. I'd like to ask the respected speaker, is this the same case in parliamentary democracy also? Is, I think this is not only the case in presidential form of government, I think this is also uh, the same case uh, from uh, in, par uh, in parliamentary, form, uh, parliamentary system of government as we have experienced uh, in, uh, so to say, of our state uh, assembly elections. That's my, uh, my third question is that, is this the same case uh, as uh, like presidential system in uh, par parliamentary form of government. That's my third question. And my last question would be a little uh, pri uh, private question. Mizotrang kasi adu le kan sa unta kan speaker sa unta kan adu le min chang se adu le min chang lo se election result po don sa kan iluruhan. Executive head 